I hope you've got all that. At least I'm not too far from the camera. So, and there's no rain. <laughs> right, so good morning. So I'll just say good morning to who's here already. We've yeah, got Laurel. yeah, Hello, yeah. Laurel, you'll be getting onto your machine soon. Oh, yes. Lynn, good Laurel. morning. Thank you for your order yesterday. Val, yep. morning. Morning, Liz and Brian. Sue Hi, Dutton. Liz and Brian. Sue's just got her moxie. Whoa, morning, yay. Morning, Sylvia. Good morning, Sylvia. Morning, Diane, Maria. Jenny, another person with her new Moxie. Yeah. Hi. All Lorraine. those Moxie people. Right. So, can you Great. confirm? Has anybody confirmed yet that the sound is okay? Yes. Good. Sound is good. And we've. Got... Well, it helps if I turn it on. I had turned it on, but it was. Uh, we did a. I did a check 40 minutes ago. It's obviously decided to turn itself off. Okay. So Lorraine said she missed the preamble, but actually the preamble was was mostly about the weather because we're British. We are. We're British, and it's cold here. So. Um, it was really, really not that interesting. For anybody who's in Esperance, etc. Good. We can now start our Facebook Live session. I've, I've been watching, um, every now and then I see John Scott on um, his Facebook Live sessions. And at the beginning, he's just sort of typing away and stuff. And because everybody takes a little while to sort of see that we're live. So I'm aware that if I give you the critical bit of information in the first minute or two, other than the weather, um, it might get missed. So I hope that it's now, I think, about three minutes past 11. We're getting better at being on time. Um, There's so many things that we have to think about when we set up these Facebook Live sessions, but hey, that's our problem. So I would love to welcome everybody to Facebook Live from Pinhole Quilting, our personal showroom, where we haven't been able to have any customers for, wow, since before Christmas, right? Since before Christmas. Um, but the good thing is, is that we've been able to dispatch some machines this year, this week because we got our moxies in. Yay! Some lots of happy people, lots of happy customers, which is brilliant. So um, Pete and I have been uh, we do a, a, some testing on those because they've come over from the states. We want to make sure everything's hunky dory before we send it all out. And one of our customers who already got her moxie um, in advance of last week, she was on the first batch, was Jo Avery, who quilted this beautiful quilt, her first quilt. This was her first quilt on her moxie. Check it out. I just, I love, Jo, I love your colors. I love the way you've quilted it. It's really beautiful organic shapes. And it looks like it was the perfect quilt to really have a go get to know the quilt, um, the quilting machine, getting to know how to use your moxie. It's really important to not put too much pressure on yourself with your first quilt. We do not recommend that the quilt that you do, the first one on the frame, is the one you've been saving for 20 years using the fabric that you inherited from your grandmother who'd passed it on and it had some emotional value. Do not do that. That is not a good idea. So if you've spent a long time making that quilt, it will have a huge amount of emotion invested in it. And what we recommend you do is do something that you, you're gonna really enjoy and you're gonna feel free. And the first ones that we tend to, to do, or we tend to recommend people do, is something like a Project Linus or the Quilt for Care Leavers or you know one of those sort of quilts that is going to be gifted. So you're gonna feel good about it anyway, right? And it doesn't matter to that person. They just love the quilt anyway. That's the key thing, is that we have that freedom to just get on, get your first quilt on quickly. I say quickly, as soon as you've, we've gone through the preamble. There's the videos that you can watch on your Moxie, and if you've got any questions, we're here. Okay, so Jo's quilt, absolutely beautiful. We're delighted, and she's got a blog post on um, the Moxie. For anybody who's interested in Moxie, uh, the delivery that we just got in, um, that's all, they're all sold. Yeah, they're, yes, they're most, all, most of them have most been them sent sold. out. But if you've ordered a Moxie from us, yeah. then we'll be getting the remaining ones out this week. Sure. So you won't have long to wait. No, we're on it. We're so, on it. Similarly, all those people who have other machines yep. uh, actually on order from us now. We've yeah. got everything in for those, so those will sure. be going out very soon. Yes. Um, thank you, uh, Pete. Pete is the coordinator for all of the, the machine dispatches and uh, the like. So, yeah, he'll be in contact with you and coordinating the date for dispatch. We've, um, yeah, we've got probably, I would say it's without a doubt the largest number of machines that we're dispatching in a couple of week period, isn't it, Pete? So, you know, we've been, we have yes. been really busy, which is lovely. However, 
with some of the stock that we've ordered, it's taken quite a while to come in. So I'm just looking at my little prompter over on my left hand side. Um, a couple of things I just want to mention. We've just got our miscellaneous delivery um, in and there are some things that we've been able to update on the website. So we're back in stock of things like um, I'm going to say the sure, oh, the surefoots are all gone out again, haven't they? Yes. Yep. So, um, so there's, there's things that have come in and then they've gone out and it's, it's, everyone's quilting, everyone's quilting, which is wonderful, but it is quite tricky sometimes to get the orders in, in, uh, in a timely fashion at the moment. Like a lot of companies, we are finding that the world and shipping is a little bit of an issue at the moment. Lots of reasons for that, some weather related. I'm not going to go into any of the other reasons why things might be a little bit delayed. So uh, that's Joe's quilt. That's an update for you on where we are with getting our stock out. Obviously, there have been a few changes. So this week, um, we had the announcement, didn't we, from, um, from Boris, for those of us in the UK, um, England, Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland, obviously they're all different. Um, but in essence, what it means is that there is light at the end of the tunnel. And as my dear dad says, it isn't necessarily the other train coming the other way. In this occasion, we see the light at the end of the tunnel as progress. And we are really looking forward um, I'm going to use that expression. We are so excited. Um, we are super excited to know that there will be a point when we can open up again, we can run classes again, and we can get you all coming down here and learning one, um, you know, for real. In the meantime, Facebook Live. Let's crack on with Facebook Live. So I'm going to move over to my desk, and Pete is going to do the camera. And we're just going to talk about a few things that might be of interest to new quilters, but also those of you who've had your machines for a while, because there are some things that are uh, common to everybody. And so the things that I'm going to cover today are things about the thread. We've built up to this. I mean, there's some Facebook Lives that we've done over the last couple of weeks where I covered things like the needle, thread, um, thread settings, matching the thread to the needle, uh, the bobbin, foundation of all your attention is the bobbin case. We talked about that. Um, if you haven't seen those Facebook Lives, then they're there on our series on Facebook and they're also on YouTube. And if you are a YouTuber, uh, we've only recently, haven't we Pete, we've only recently, relatively recently, got into uh, YouTube and watching stuff on YouTube because we didn't have a wide enough broadband stream to be able to get YouTube. So we're sort of discovering things about it. But actually, um, the YouTube channel that we've got there, if you subscribe to our YouTube channel, you will be notified when we load up our new videos. And over the period, we will be putting more and more of those together that might be of interest to you. So definitely subscribe to our YouTube channel. And it also helps us as well. Once we get a thousand subscribers, we become quite a significant player in the YouTube market. And we haven't got anywhere near that. So um, it's going to take us a while. Now, um, that's the past. We've built up, we've got our understanding. We know the foundation, but sometimes things happen. And we have, when we do our installations, we give out these four sheets that we, we went through last time. And on these four sheets, we talk about the needles, we match the thread to the needle, we talk about the tension. That's TNT, that's the first one. And then we talk about troubleshooting of the tension issues. If your top thread is laying flat, your bobbin thread is laying flat, loops on the bottom, uh, etc. And we talk about the six steps to successful machine long arm quilting. So high quality thread, making sure that your machine is threaded up correctly. Certainly when you're beginning, using the same color thread on the top and the bottom is a really good thing to do. And in our foundation workshop, we talk about how variegated thread can pre present additional challenges to you because, and not everybody knows this until they've been reading about it, is that for when you've got variegated thread, the amount of dye that is used for, say, the black, yellow, red, beautiful tiger type uh, thread that you're using, the amount of dye varies. 
So that means that as it goes through the tension discs, it's actually changing the tension and the amount of tension that's on the top thread. And if you use it in your bobbin as well, the same thing happens. We always set the bobbin tension first, and you should always test your tension. So, you know, we use a piece on the side, we use that additional amount of backing fabric and wadding to put another piece on the top, or we have a very similar fabric and wadding to in our quilt to test it on. Very important, use the same. Otherwise, it's not a proper test. Now, that's all well and good. We're now onto the last page of our four page handout that we give. It's very helpful. It's a bit like, um, you remember Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe by Douglas Adams um, back in the 80s. And it ha had in nice friendly letters, don't panic. Well, ours has got help on the top, common quilting issues. Help, my needle broke. We don't need to talk about that because what we want to talk about is help, my thread is shredding or breaking. So I would like to go into a few details about why that might happen. Now, if you've set your bobbin tension very tight, you might find that the top tension in order to be balanced is also very tight. And if you're using a hundred weight thread or you're using an 80 weight thread, or you're using, say those might be polyester or silk, those will be, those, you know, silk's very strong, but, um, and polyester can be very strong. But if you set your bobbin thread a little too tight, it's going to be hard for that top thread if it's a very fragile thread. Um, we also find the same thing that if you're looking at using a cotton thread, we would recommend a three ply thread rather than two ply. So that is key thing, is the strength of the thread. We've got quite a long distance between where our thread comes up off the cone and where it goes into the needle, which is longer than on a domestic machine. Um, the other thing, of course, that we alluded to, and what we discussed last week, is matching your thread with your needle. And we've got a variety of packs so that you can have like a, a pack of multi 12, 14, 16, 18, 20 uh, size needles in one pack. So it's a good way to experiment. The other thing that can happen, and um, Al and I, we did have this a few times when we, at the beginning, when we were doing Handy Quilter, uh, we'd say, oh, bring in, bring in your thread, bring in your thread to the foundation workshop, and uh, we'll show you that you can stitch with it. Well, this one time, I think the lady brought in her entire thread collection, um, and we, we managed to get everything to work, but my goodness, I mean, you remember those old wooden spools with the coats thread when, you know, coats used to make cotton thread up in Manchester. Well, you know, she'd got those and um, it's not going to be a good thing to be able to sew with those on your long arm, honestly. So poor quality thread, old thread is not going to help. More physical things are things like Say, I, I don't think this is very common. I certainly have not, never really had a, a big issue with this, but it is possible. If you've hit the hook, um, if, if it has actually got damaged, and it is possible to damage the hook, which is an expensive component, you don't want to do it, um, but say the needle's dropped down, it is possible to, uh, to dent the hook. And we can um, file it down with very, very fine um, file or uh, paper, but that burr, because that's what the thread is going around, is being taken through uh, the top thread, that burr can cause your thread to break. It very, I think that's pretty unusual. And you'd know, you'd know if you'd hit something. The other thing is a burr on a needle, and then, you know, that can happen even if you've just put in a brand new needle. And we've had that, haven't we, Pete? We've, we've, yes, I yeah. had one occasion where so, I had some thread breaking on the machine. So first thing, change the needle, to put a completely brand new needle in, and the same thing happened. Of course, needles are quite precisely manufactured components. Even the new needle had a problem with it. <laughs> when I changed the needle a second time for another brand new needle, everything was absolutely fine. Yeah, and one of the other things that is, can happen if you have an issue 
is it can be more than one problem. It can be two. And we've also had that where we think we've solved the problem and actually there was a burr on the needle and a burr on a foot simultaneously. So Mike's asking, does thread deteriorate with age? Well, apparently cotton thread can. Um, and actually, you know, cotton is a natural product. It depends where you are in the world as well. So moisture content can deteriorate thread as well. I'm not an expert on that. So I will just say, apparently it can. Um, I don't know any more than that. I should ask my, uh, my sister-in-law. She's a conservator. I think she would probably know. But um, that's not something I'm an expert on. I've, I don't use old thread. That's the easiest way to do it. But I don't think, um, you know, a, a, not a short period. I wouldn't expect it to happen in a short period if you've got good quality thread. Now, the other thing to look out for is, in terms of burrs, the thread guides, you know, you've got scissors. You could have been um, hanging uh, your scissors and hit something and just caused a bit of metal to scratch up. I don't know, but say you've got a burr on a thread guide or you've used so much, um, you've done so many stitches, you can wear the tension discs and you can wear the spring. So those things can cause a burr and cause the thread to break. So say your thread is broken. Let's just sort of step through that scenario. Okay, the scenario is this. Your niece or nephew um, is coming up to visit with their parents and they're coming up from Cornwall in the summer and you've promised your niece or nephew a lovely quilt and it's gonna be wrapped up, ready for them to unwrap when they visit. And you are literally doing the last bits on this quilt. You might even be doing the binding on the frame because you know the time is gone. Goodness knows where the time's gone. There's a little bit of pressure here and the thread breaks. So we're in that scenario where we know that they're coming. We wanna get the quilt finished and time is going. The thread is broken. Where has the thread broken? Has it broken low down? Does it look like it's been shredded? So is there a long part of the thread where you can see it's been worn? A lot of the time that means that the needle is a bit too small for that thread because it's going through the groove of the needle so many times, like over 30 times for every stitch, it's going to be wearing. Or is it quite a sharp cut just in one place? Because that usually would indicate more of a burr. Where is that burr? Have a look before you unthread it all in frustration because you realize that they're halfway up and they just, you just recommend that they stop off at, a, at the um, Gloucester services for a long coffee or something. Um, if that is the case, then you still, you need to know a bit more information. So try and c collect all your evidence as to what the might be the issue. Now, the other thing is that that problem could be, and we've, we've seen this with, um, with some of the glide thread, it could be that the thread is sort of unraveling. And I know that there are customers who will be, um, who will be looking with interest at, uh, or hearing with interest what I say on this point. I'm just gonna see if I can watch the Facebook Live myself. Um, anyway, the, the point is that that thread unraveling, I've seen a lot of comments about this online recently, and some people suggest that, well, first of all, I think it partly depends on how, what the twist of the thread is and how it's being dispensed off the cone. So whether it's a clockwise or an anti-clockwise wind onto the cone. Because, and the reason I say this is because years ago I met the, the guy who runs the Spanish company, is it Spanish or was it Portuguese? Presencia, um, the Mediterranean. And um, Valencia, where's Valencia? I can't remember. Um, yeah, they, they said that their machines were set up specifically so that when they wind the thread, when they put it on the cone as well, that's two twists, that they, whichever way around they put it, 
ensured that when it came off, it did not untwist. Now, I think there is a possibility that the variety of the wind is partly to blame for this issue. So if you're getting that, it would be really useful actually to do a little poll. Tell us what way round the cone is wound if you're having an issue. So let's get some information because then I can, I can ask Clyde the question. I don't have enough information at the moment. So that's one thing. And the other thing is that in those tension discs, it seems to sort of be an issue as it goes through those tension discs. So I think it's squashing it. But someone also suggested that it was a left to right, right to left issue. So we are just going to go in a second onto this bit here, which is slight. Oh, it is, it is in shot, isn't it? Yes, it's in shot. The, so the twist in the thread and the tension discs are things that we need to get a bit more information about. Send us the information. If you've been having a problem with a particular cone, tell us whether it's anti-clockwise or clockwise wound. So one of the issues is because these are slick threads. Now, when we first got the glide in, I found that one of our very good quilters had bought a whole load of glide and was winding her own bobbins, putting the glide thread on the top and the bottom, beautiful, but she was getting little loops. So everything would be hunky-dory and then suddenly a little twist, either on the top or the bottom. And she was very puzzled about this. So Alan, our engineer, he was doing some work on the machine and he had it perfectly timed. And bearing in mind that Alan is probably, well, he is definitely the most experienced engineer on handy quilter machines in Europe. You know, Alan is pretty good at these things and he's very determined and he couldn't work out what the problem was. And he put it down to the thread. What we got, what she had was two very, very slick threads working together. And I, so I spoke to, uh, to Kimi Bruner, um, who was the person that had first introduced us to, uh, to the glide threads. And I said to, to Kimi, you know, we've got this problem with these threads. And she suggested that if that happens, if you put a thread that's a bit more furry on the underside, that it can resolve the problem. The reason is, is very similar to a machine embroidery thread where we've got very slick, slick threads like rayon and stuff like that. And what we normally team them up with is a, a much less expensive um, embroidery uh, thread like um, a bobbin fill, something like, um, I'm gonna say metal is stop from stickle garn. That's also very good, uh, which is a cotton and it's a fine cotton and it's got a bit of fur to it and it grabs the thread and it stops that issue. So if you are getting that problem, Magnusoft is a really good team up with that in mind. So uh, I know we had a, prob um, a question from uh, a very experienced quilter this morning who sent a picture to say of this issue. And I don't know whether that will resolve it for you, but I definitely think it's worth, worth a go. So um, Magnusoft or something else that's got a little bit more fur to it. And I, I, when I say fur, you know those bits like the lint that's on cotton that doesn't get gassed off. That would be helpful, I think. Um, the other thing is sewing from right to left. A number of people online on different groups have spoken about left to right, right to left sewing. Now, Pete and I have discussed this and our, our, in our experience, if the machine is perfectly timed, you won't have an issue going in any direction. Now, the reason for this and I probably do need that camera just slightly moved over, Pete. I don't know if you can, I just want to get over to this bit as well. Um, thank you. Um, perfect. So the, the reason for this is the way that the thread is stitched with the top and the bottom thread can determine whether you have a skip stitch or not. So what I've drawn here is a not a very good circle, is the needle and the green thread. When the needle goes through the fabric, the purple fabric, what it's doing is it's going through and at that point, the thread has a slacker tension. 
So to enable it, as it rises again, this distance here, it's going up, it's going down, and then it's going up again by a specific distance. For most machines, it's 2.2 millimeters, precisely. That enables a little loop to form. The hook goes round and it's taking that thread and it's forming the stitch by going through here. So it comes over the face of the bobbin case. If you watch it underneath, you'll see that. Uh, you'll see the thread go there. And it goes through here. If that loop is not presented to the hook, it will not form the stitch. You'll get a skip stitch. So why? Why could that be? There are many factors. It could be that the needle height is, for some reason, it might, it could change. If this, if this needle bar has got any slackness in it, that can change. So say you hit something very, very hard, it could push the needle a bit up a bit, and it's no longer 2.2 millimeters, for example. It could be that you've bent the needle away. So say you're moving, say you're in manual mode, and you're moving the machine very quickly around, it's going to move and deflect and bend the needle. These are industrial needles, they're very strong, but when you've got the threat of the needle going down into the fabric and it's moving around, it can get deflected. And that can cause, that could cause it to miss the stitch. So the other thing would be if the timing isn't correct. Now, when we time the machine and there's a little sort of cutout at the back of the, there's a hole in the needle. At the back, you've got the groove down the front and the thread goes down there through the eye. And there's this little scarf at the back, a little sort of cutout. The hook just touches on our machines. It just touches the needle. That's what the timing is set to. And I've written up here some of the things that are important about why our free arm, long arm quilting machines are slightly different to domestic machines. It starts as it's an industrial needle. So that means it's much stronger. And the MR needles are designed not only like the, the R needles, but they're designed to be slightly stronger as well. And they have what's called a crank shank. The domestic versus long arm point I've put up here is because a domestic machine is timed to not touch the needle. It's timed to have a slight gap. And what that means is, is that when that hook comes past and it's got that little loop, on a domestic machine, if you are at certain points of a clock face, it might skip the stitch more than on our machines. I know that's quite technical, but there are some people who are watching that are at a point in their long arm learning curve where this kind of information might totally make sense. Um, and I also wanted to point out the fact that putting a domestic machine on a frame doesn't always work because of how it's timed and it's different to how our long arms are timed. And what you get is if this is taking the needle from above, this is the front of the machine, this is the right and this is the left, that's the back of the machine. Imagine I'm looking down on the needle, it's going down. It's got the loop of the fabric of the thread is at the back here. Okay. And if I'm going left, right, front, very, very quickly, that, that loop is critical to the formation of the stitch. And at some points, if I am going very, very quickly, it is possible for that loop to just be too far away and the hook misses it. Anything, Pete? Yeah, I hope so, that's been, I know it's a bit technical, but. Yeah, it is quite technical, but the top thread forms a loop and the bobbin thread has to go through the loop to form the stitch. Yeah. So if the loop isn't formed for any reason, the, skip, the, the, the stitch will skip. So in France's example, she sent us the photo of, actually, you can see that the stitching is absolutely perfect. The tension on most of the stitches is absolutely spot on, but there is one skip stitch right in the middle. So there's nothing wrong with the machine, there's nothing wrong with the timing, 
but for some reason that loop has not formed on that one stitch. Yep. It could be that there was just a little twist in the top thread at that particular time, so there was no loop for the bobbin thread to catch. So uh, there's really, in some cases, not a lot you can do about that, so the question then is how you, how you fix it but it doesn't mean there's anything wrong with the machine at all. It can be in a whole host of reasons, yep. because you will see that from time to time. Yep. Um, so Francis was using bottom line in ah, the bobbin. Ah, okay, that's useful to know. Um, Which is usually a very good. And what was on the top? I don't think she said what's on the top. And uh, Lorraine has said that she's got shredding with glide 40 top and bottom spool is wound anti-clockwise okay. and it's when quilting right to left in straight lines yeah so right to left is more difficult for machines than left to right yeah and it's about how that this because this and I'm, I'm certainly not going to try and explain this this is going round in this direction and basically the default is that if the timing is pretty good, it will the the loop will be closer to the needle and the hook going in that direction because of this going like that. If it was going like that, I believe that it would be better in that direction. So it's to do with the fact that we have a clockwise uh, anti-clockwise rotation of the of yes. the hook. Yes. Okay, so Frances was using either Glide or Magnifico on the top, so she's got a, a polyester, polyester shiny thread. It's a very common combination. I mean, I, I wouldn't expect there to be any particular yeah. issues with that. So Maria says technical but fascinating, really helpful. That's okay. good, good because this can get a little bit complex. Yeah, I, I'm aware that the, I might have lost a few people. So we'll get back into ruler work in a second. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, Jackie says that she's also had a problem with bottom line on the bottom with and getting loops on the top. Right. Um, okay. So right. Maureen says, so how do we fix those loops then? Excellent. Good time. Well timed question. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. How do we how do we solve those loops? And I was going to get if, if you're a beginner, don't worry too much about this. Really don't worry too much about this. This is really more for the advanced user, but it's also to reassure you that if you occasionally get a skip stitch, that is not necessarily any real problem or anything that you've done or anything the machine has done. Well, yeah. Okay. Now, I just, sorry. Right. This is not going to, sh I haven't got a, I don't think I've got a skip stitch on here, but I just want to show you what you can do with this little tool. Now, I haven't got any in, for sale at the moment because I was struggling to get any. I don't know why, but they didn't have them at our supplier. Um, but imagine that this is a skip stitch. So say it was here. What you can do, oh, sorry, I should explain. This is a soft touch thread pick. Okay, it's a Clover product. So you might find your local quilt shop has got one of these. I don't think most people know what they are, but anyway, it's got a, it's an incredibly fine uh, crochet hook. And what you can do, you can put it in to your th fabric, your quilt sandwich, and then catch the thread, the, the offending thread, and then pull it, oh, I'm not doing a very good job on this one. Pull it through. Wow, that was the worst demo in history. Okay, let me try this one. You can see the principle. Yeah. So it's fairly straightforward. You grab that thread and, pull, and it down. pull it through, pull it through, and then twist it to get it out again. Now, the only problem I've found, and then you can cut that off. Let me do that again. I'm really not doing. So that then is just sitting in the body of the quilt. Yeah, it's just like finishing off a quilting stitch. Yeah. There we go does split it sometimes. So there we go. That would then be finishing it off. It's actually really good for broken threads as well. Like if you get a, um, if you're on pro stitcher and then you can just cut that off and it's gone. Can you see that? 
So yeah. there we go, that's my thread hidden. You can, so, I mean, there are techniques for using the spiral eye needles. You could use those as well. Um, but this one is quite, despite my uh, incredibly ineffective demonstration, um, that, that this is actually really good when the quilt is on the frame. Yeah. Okay, okay, so Sylvia says that she only has issues when the bobbin thread is running low. Would the magnetic bobbin help? Yeah, yeah, it would. It would. That that, would that's why if you've got very Magna thread. Soft is really good, to yes. be fair. Um, it's a really good thread um, for that reason. It's just the consistency of it, you know, right across the wind, um, which is interesting, isn't it? Um, okay, that's... That's it really. And I think, you know, on this discussion that we've got on this Facebook Live, it would be great if people can ask some questions because, you know, after this session, what we do is we go through all those questions. We kind of go, right, yeah, the answer to this is this and this. So. so a question as to what that's called, that is called a soft touch thread pick. It's not in focus there, but it's called a soft touch thread pick from Clover. We usually have them in stock, but we just haven't been able to get any. At no, the I don't know what, I don't know why. But a very, very, very fine ended crochet hook is what it is. The next thing we are going to cover, unless there's any further questions or any comments, Pete? No. Nope. So we've done that, we've done that, we've done that. Shredding, twist, skip stitches, tension discs. You might find that by just loosening off your bobbin thread tension a little bit, being able to slacken off the top thread, that your tension discs are not compressing the glide thread or whatever you're using and uh, causing any issues. Right, next, we're on. A question from Joyce, which is sort of uh, relevant. Okay, go is ahead. There, is there a time when you might not thread the thread through all three holes on the pretensioner? Yes, yes, there is. Threading through all three holes is gonna put more of a twist on the thread. So actually, with something like glide, you could try putting it through two holes. You might get less yeah. twisting of the thread if you do that. Yep. But generally, you would put um, finer thread through fewer holes on the pretensioner. If you've got a very fine thread, you only need to use one of those holes on the pretensioner. It's sort yeah. of a separate issue, but it does, it can affect the twisting of the thread as well, which can lead to those loops. Now, next. Rulers. 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 Ruler bases. This is a ruler base for um, either an Avanti or a Simply 16. It's got 18 on it, so it's for an Avanti. This brown paper comes off. This is a, a basically a new one. This is a ruler base. So our free arm goes in here. There are little lugs on the machine that these go into, and you push it on, and that is for an Amara or a Forte. And the one I've got on there is a Moxie, which looks very much like this one. And we've got the, this is the Moxie one. So for a 15 inch, and with the Moxie, you get the little retain the little lugs that the ruler base fits into where, with the um, with the ruler base kit, and you just have to screw those in place, and they're, they're using the Allen key to tighten them. So I, I did that on the Moxie just over here, and if we turn around to look at the Moxie now, looking at lovely Joe's lovely quilt. Let's have a look at some examples <clears throat> of what you can do with rulers. Now, the reason that we're talking about rulers today is because we've got a special offer, haven't we, Pete? Yeah. We've got a special offer. And a special offer, I will tell you after I've done this little demo. The, so there's a, that's a, using an oval ruler and how effective it is when you put little radiating lines. So starting from the outside, coming in, going back out again, and it creates this really sort of more dynamic shape. So that's the mini oval ruler. Mini oval ruler. You can use for the center, which I really like actually. It's very nice. Ruler. It's a lovely ruler. It's lovely. Um, so we've got, I thought I'd just show you, oh, this is the, the other thing is that you can um, do continuous line designs like this one, which was done using the Versatool, the gentle curve on the Versatool, and then uh, basically going over the, effectively the two blocks with them, some ribbon candy. That was just so I could practice my ribbon candy. And you can, when we do our classes, we, we uh, get you to practice on some gridded square handy quilter fabric. And those new Moxie owners will ha have some of this 
gridded square fabric, don't they? they get the, it's in the kit, um, which is lovely because then you can practice. That's the same size as, as for the versatile. And you can practice doing continuous line. It's like um, make a really good design for something like nine patch. So that is that. Now, I thought I would share with you some of the, there's three of these, and I just wanted to explain what the difference is between them. So that's the line grid quarter. That's the matchstick. Okay. So one other thing before we get onto those rulers is we recommend that you have not only the ruler base, so we've now got a nice firm surface to work on, but we change our regular foot to a sure foot. And there we go. If I put those on there, you'll see the different profile. So the sure foot has a much deeper profile than the standard ruler foot that comes with the machine. It makes it very difficult for you to strike the ruler with the needle, which is what we want to avoid. Yep, absolutely. So the sure foot is, I, I, don't, I don't recommend using a ruler without the sure foot now. Because uh, ever since we brought the sure foot out, we found people have just grown in confidence. The other thing that you can put on the bottom of the rulers to stop them skip, skipping around and skidding around is some uh, of the handy grip, which is a like a little comes in a packet like this. You get 12 strips, which is tons, because you don't need that much um, on the bottom of the ruler, but it just stops the ruler from moving too much. However, there are times when you actually want to be able to move it around. So you can use the other side, but you have to be careful because the accuracy of the rulers is designed to be seen from the top. And for consistency, you need to use the top um, because the thickness of the ruler will distort it otherwise. If you're a very precise person, that will be uh, important. Now, these ones then, um, the way that we put the ruler on, is uh, that we have this needle up and even though the thread is connected to the quilt we can just put it over and down now this is the moxie is a line so that the needle is in front of the foot for a lot of our machines that we will have the the foot this is the same as the infinity the foot will be to the left of the needle but it's the same principle you'll just be doing it from the other side you'll be going on like that so we put it on like this, and then we can stitch, we can align our, the edge of our line grid ruler or our matchstick ruler with the sewn lines that we've just made, or um, we can move it around and use other things for reference. And we've got some angled lines on here. So I've been using the angled line to do this little matchstick one. So let me just show you how we do that. So the matchstick ruler, you can either align, let me put that on, you can either align the foot with the, the line that you've sewn or you can use the gap in the middle, if I just move this along like so, you can either do that and you line this edge here up with the previously sewn line or when you're sewing along, you get to the end and you move it along to within this uh, cutout. And once you've done that, you press stop and then you move over the ruler and this gap determines the distance between your lines instead of using these lines for alignment. So now we can move that back in this direction and I'm just keeping contact with that left-hand side. And then I'm going to do the same thing again. I'm going to move over within the gap, press stop, and now move my ruler over. And it's actually less than a quarter of inch. And when you get to the end and it feels like it's about to pivot, press stop, needle down, and then keep going to the end and press stop. So the settings that I use for that are, I've got 11 stitches per inch, I'm on cruise, and I've got 50 stitches per minute 
as my cruise speed. And what that means is when I press start on this Moxie, it's the right hand button, when I press start, it will sew very, very slowly. And that means that my ruler is coming out of the work and it means I can go along and line up for my next line. Press stop. Let me just see if I did that right. I'll just move it slightly, there we go. And now move that along there. It's a little bit difficult because I'm not right in front of the machine because we're filming. And then stop. Okay, and we could do um, a crosswise, so we could go up this way and then along within the ruler like that and then move it. Right. Move along to the edge of the gap and then move the ruler up. Move along and then there we go. So that's a nice matchstick ruler. These are quite nice rulers for beginners because they're internal rulers. So the foot is within an enclosed space, which actually makes them easier to use than it using is. on the outside of some of the rulers, such as the wave rulers, for example. Yeah. So this is just to show you what the difference would be. If I were to use this one, this gap, this one is the matchstick. If you look, the gap is slightly less. And then the other one we've got is the half inch gap. So that's slightly more there. So they're very similar rulers. These so they, two, these two are called the line grid rulers with different size gaps in the middle. Yeah. And the smallest, thinnest one is the matchstick. matchstick. So that's an eighth, that's a quarter, and this is a half. And it's this gap that it's just sort of, it's determining what that distance is. So again, if I go along to the edge, and when I say the edge, I'm moving the foot till it hits this side. Then I move the ruler over. Yeah, and then move it over again. There we go. So now my distance, if I take that off, you'll see it better. My distance is now determined by this ruler and it's gone to a quarter of an inch instead of the eighth. So nice way of getting various different designs. It gives you some design ideas on the back, like the cross hatching I've just done. Obviously piano keys is a really good one. Uh, I know that QuiltCon was on last week in the States and you know, modern quilting very much loves these sort of effects. So I've just used the curve ruler and I've done what would effectively be like a border or something like that. And I've just shown the different distances that you can quilt with. With any of them, I, any of those three, we can always use the alignment of the, the lines to the left of the, um, the straight line uh, to determine the distance instead of using the internal measurement. So if you want wider lines, you can still use that. Okay. So Laura asks who designs the handy quilter rulers. Um, a whole host of people, I think, is the answer to that. Yep. A lot of them have been designed by the handy quilter ambassadors. Um, or educators, um, but some of them have indeed been designed by Westerly, but I think that's only a, a minority of the yeah. handy quilter rulers. There's, but there are a, a few recently that have been designed by yeah. the Westerly people. That's, that's right. Yes, they, they did do a few. Um, and it's pretty clear on the packaging which ones those are. So if you have a look at their website. Also, just to mention that the videos, um, a lot of these their rulers are on their uh, Ruler of the Month Club. And for each of those Ruler of the Month Club rulers, they've done a video. So it explains brilliantly how to use these. And we've got links on our product pages on our website. So, you know, that's a great way to find out whether that route is gonna work for you before you ever get it. So Jenny, we'll get back to you separately on that question, Jenny, rather than dealing with it now. Brian says the Clover soft touch thread picks are available from well-known site. Oh, Brian, disappointing. <laughs> can, you, can you please find a nice little independent company that you can yes. support? Uh, Helen says the various alignment marks are brilliant. Yeah, great. Now, a special offer is if you buy two or more rulers this week, up until next Saturday, we will give you a free 2x6 mini ruler. Mini ruler. 
very, very handy, very handy size. So this is great for, for sort of doing lots and lots of straight, you know, any straight lines really. I could have, could have actually used this if I wanted to um, for this one. So I could just align that with that instead. But what you find is that having this for doing those fine matchsticks within here for beginners, as Pete said, is a little easier. But this is a great little ruler. It's also faster to do that type of line with this ruler. Yeah. And I should say, this is an old version. You see they've got the little grid in there and the measurements. So that one's a very old one. They've improved it. So that one is great. And that will come free if you order two rulers. Um, what else? Oh, yeah. So the other thing I was going to talk about was um, how much time we got? Three minutes. Three minutes until we've been on for 55. Now, the whole thing about the blog post that I wrote this week is really about solving problems. And I thought it was, um, it was that one of those moments when I, I thought, actually, when I, well, I used to be a systems engineer for IBM, so I used to have to solve a lot of really technical problems. And I had spent quite a bit of time, you know, learning technical stuff. But actually, it wasn't just about the technical stuff and understanding that that really determined whether I solved a problem or not. Most of the time, it was my attitude to that issue. Like, if you are expecting that niece or nephew to drive up the motorway and you've just had your thread break, if your first reaction is just frustration and to want to throw the long arm out the window, it's going to be very difficult to resolve the issue. You've maybe now left it quite late. I mean, this is me. I was, I was that person whose niece was coming up on the motorway um, with her parents. And um, I won't say it was lucky that it was a holdup, but it was lucky there was a holdup because I did actually finish the quilt um, and they love it, which is brilliant. And I didn't have a thread break, so that was great. But if I had, what would have my, my reaction been? It would have been a bit stressed. So what we find is, you know, we get people who've got issues with their machines from time to time. Um, sometimes it's what we call pilot error, um, but other times, you know, can be the machine, can be they hit a pin, whatever. But the way that people react to that issue really varies. So some people will say, yeah, I had to step away from the machine. I went back the following morning and amazingly it worked. The number of times that happens. So I've put some quotes on the blog post. I hope you enjoy reading it. It's all about Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance, but we're gonna call it Zen and the art of quilting from now on. So Zen and the art of resolving our quilting issues, our long arm quilting issues. Just remember that the way that you approach the problem and if you go back to first principles, which is what the book is a lot about, a lot of it is about that, um, then things, good things happen. So my motorcycle story is this, that um, it was a bit of a Midnight Express moment. I was in Morocco in the late 1980s on a trail bike, driving down with my friend Mark um, at Agadir, right? We just climbed Jebel Tubkal, with our ice axes and crampons, we decided to go to the beach. So we're going down the edge of this dual carriageway, but on a motorcycle route. And before I know it, I'm going along this trail bike. I've only just learned how to use the trail bike. I won't say I'm an experienced motorcyclist. And this woman comes along on a little moped, beep, 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 very, very fast. And as she goes past me, she gets her handlebar caught in the jacket pocket of my sort of very voluminous jacket slams across my back wheel into me and then tears off towards the road but goes flying about 30 feet in the air. It's not a good moment. Anyway, before I knew it, I had about 30 Moroccans around me and um, who'd taken the key to my motorbike so I couldn't drive away. And Mark went off to find the motorcycle hire guy and left me with all these people. And I think, you know, at that moment, this is my moment. This is my Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance moment of being calm and not panicking. Um, anyway, three, to cut a long story short, to cut a long story very short, three or four hours later, after I had signed a confession in Arabic um, and spoken to the head of the police in Agadir at the police station um, and been interviewed, I was released without charge and uh, the reason was because my jacket pocket was ripped on my left hand side so it showed that I was on the correct side of the road. 
So being calm, knowing that you're in the right, that things are going to get resolved, it's a very, very important trait to have. And I didn't end up in a rock in the jail, fortunately. I did have flashbacks of Midnight Express, but anyway, it was absolutely fine. Um, but the funny thing was, as the, as the chief of the police was asking me my name, he, I said, um, Elizabeth. And he said, oh, like the queen. And uh, my second name's Anne. And he said, oh, like the princess. Are, are you related to royalty? <laughs> no. Unfortunately, not at this point. So, uh, listen, I hope that you all have enjoyed this session. Um, we've covered quite a few different things. And Pete's just going to ask me a question. Uh, Jean says that the soft touch thread pick is also available from lots of independents. Good, good. I, I recommend Yeah, I think search. the cotton patch has got it amongst other independents. <laughs> <so> I'm not. <laughs> uh, you, you, you need to declare an interest. I do that. have an interest. <laughs> uh, yep. Jackie says that she recently cleaned the frame six times, looking for a reason that she couldn't stitch around a curved ruler, only to find that she was pressing too hard, and the seams wow. of the quilt were catching between the ruler base and the machine. There we are. Don't That's a really important one. I meant to mention that, actually, when I was using it. It's actually a relatively light touch. What we do on the classes, and I don't know whether this will be possible sort of in our sort of new COVID world, is I quite often put my hand on the ruler for the customer and they move the handlebars. Then when they put their hand back on the ruler, they realize the reason they couldn't move the handlebars was because they were pressing too hard. It's a guide. Uh, Val asks, do we need to put in any code with our order um, to qualify for the free ruler? No, anybody who orders two yep. uh, standard rulers from us this week will have the mini ruler added automatically yep. by us. Pete's very good at doing that kind of thing. And I think that's it for today. Uh, we will do, be doing something else next week. We've got a busy week ahead. We've got lots of machines to get out, as we say. And we look forward to getting your questions. Any further questions, comments um, about the issues and uh, the things we've discussed today would be great. So we look forward to seeing you next Saturday on our Saturday Live, 11 a.m., 6th of February. See you then. Thanks, Sarah. Bye. Bye.